I guess we're ready to start. Welcome. Uh, my name is Daniel Ben Horan. Uh, I'm the moderator of this this panel. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we forget how rapidly change happens, and it, it wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to do good in the world, you you did it as an NGO or nonprofit uh, with philanthropic funding, and if you wanted to make money. Uh, you didn't talk about doing good in the world. And now both of those models seem about equally boring. Uh, there's obviously a, uh, a blending of um, interest in making a difference in the world and interest in sustaining one's own life and having meaning in, in their life. And our, our panelists today are anything but boring. Uh, I, I see this as a panel really about the dimensionality and the resilience of capitalism and its ability to adapt. And I, I say that as someone who doesn't consider himself a capitalist. Uh, so without any further ado, since we have really exciting panelists, our first one is Kreston Buch, is a serial entrepreneur turned investor who uh, uh, took over and grew Bold DK to be Denmark's largest sports media with 45 uh, million page views a month. And uh, in, in 2009, since 2009, he has made 10 early stage investments, eight of them in Kenya. Beside Mobile Web, he has invested in uh, the First Division Kenyan Football Club. And you can see him wearing the, journey, the jersey. Uh, Creston, please. Thank you very much. So as uh, entrepreneurship is all about uh, experimenting, so I'm going to just start with a little experiment. So if, if everybody could uh, close their eyes, and then uh, close their eyes and then uh, think about uh, Africa and think about what, what pictures uh, come to your mind and just, uh, just remember those pictures and I'll see if the, the experiment worked later on. Um, so, uh, as, the moder as Daniel said, uh, I went to Kenya in 2009 and I made some money from uh, my other businesses and I wanted to start doing some investment. I met a Kenyan in, at Stanford University and I thought that instead of just investing here in Europe or go to the US, I thought why not uh, go to emerging market Africa where uh, the Kenyan convinced me there was a huge market opportunity. So I, I went there and uh, I raised a small fund uh, partly with my own money and with uh, 15 other private investors. And we made, so far I've made eight investments in mobile web. So it's tech startups. Uh, we invested in a football website in Kenya that now has 120,000 users. We invested in a site selling uh, drugs online. Uh, we invested in a hyper-local news website. Uh, we invested in a, in a, in a company that does uh, backup from mobile phones, feature phones. Um, so, uh, after I invested in the first seven, I decided to uh, try to do like a more uh, structured program, like an accelerator, based on the model of Y Combinator and Techstars and Startup Bootcamp. Um, and uh, that's going to kick off here in September, uh, where we'll invest in 10 Kenyan startups. Two months ago, we signed a deal with Google to be partners with Google in Africa for investing in, in tech. And so we're going to take the program to Cape Town uh, in February. And it's actually, the program is open for everybody. It's not just for African companies. It's for all entrepreneurs who wants to come and start a business in Africa and target the emerging market Africa. 
So we have teams applying from we've had teams applying from Mexico, from uh, from India, and also from Europe. So all entrepreneurs that want to come uh, to the program or apply for the program are in Europe are, are, are most welcome. So if we just speak about like the like the political part of why 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 am I doing this? Uh, I mean we invest to make money. And one of the reasons that I believe that uh, th that is important is that uh, no country in the world has uh, been wealthy due to foreign aid. I mean, there's not a country you can point to saying, okay, they, this country got a huge amount of aid and now they are all wealthy. If we look at Ghana in the 60s, it, the, the Ghana was richer than South, uh, South Korea in the 60s. Since that, uh, Ghana has grew four times, South Korea has grown 400 times. And, I mean, Ghana has received massively more aid than, 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 South, America, than uh, South Korea. But the difference is, of course, that it's, it's basically, it's, it's capitalism that has driven that, or free market or market economy that has driven that wealth. Uh, so if I just go back to you closing your eyes, now we'll just see, how many, uh, how many of you got pictures about like wildlife in your head when you close your eyes? Okay. <laughs> how, how, many, how many got pictures of starving kids or uh, AIDS problem or war? Also quite a lot. How many, how many got pictures of like a uh, fast moving, uh, really interesting uh, market for uh, business with 40% uh, of the population under 25, the most rapid growth of mobile phones, uh, the biggest emerging middle class. So, <laughs> not so many. So, so I think the, the, the point of why I'm doing what I'm doing is that if I can, uh, if I can make money in Africa, uh, I can show that, you know, that Africa is a place you go invest, it's not just a place you throw foreign aid and we're like up against the aid industry because the aid industry the reason why you have all these pictures is also because of the aid industry the aid industry has to market Africa as a way of only you know that's only bad things there because you're not gonna go to a donor and say look at all the good things why don't you donate you're gonna, you're gonna emphasize all the bad things so so the, yeah, my point is that we need to balance the story. There needs to come something. People need to think of Africa as a business or a business opportunity and not just as aid, so we can get capital flowing to Africa and not just aid. Thank you. Thank you. So our, our, next, uh, our next speaker is Ben. ben and I, let me apologize for what I'm sure are going to be many errors in German pronunciation of names. Uh, please bear with me. Ben Leonard is the chief marketing officer at Six Wunderkinder. During this time, he was responsible for developing a new tech. Uh, before he worked there, he was responsible for developing a new technology platform that established the foundation of personalized medical medicine research among cancer and HIV patients. Uh, his goal in life is to create beautiful, truly human product user experiences that are focused on improving the lives of many. Ben? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you already said everything <laughs> that you should know. Okay, um, so we'll move on. It's fine, I, we can move on. <laughs> no, um, I mean, right now uh, I joined Six Wonder Kinder here in Berlin uh, in January, uh, beginning of February, um, to lead the product design team and the communications. Um, before that, I worked for five years in biotech and healthcare and my background is design. So everybody um, who I met in the biotech career asked me, what the hell are you doing here as a designer? I mean, we have engineers, we have scientists, we have researchers, but why do we need a designer? Um, and my last job, we, we built a complete new um, disruptive techno platform, technology platform, hardware and software for HIV, cancer research. Um, I traveled the world um, a lot. I was in South Africa, in Asia, in Brazil. Um, what I saw is um, that I could, I could make a difference with, with design, with what, what I learned, um, because my philosophy of design is that I'm, I'm totally 
focused on human beings. And what I want to do is by making products useful, technology useful and usable, um, helping them to, to, to make their lives better. Um, that sounds really optimistic and it sounds a bit naive, but that's what I, what I saw. I mean, I, we, we developed a uh, technology that helped people do research um, for HIV vaccine um, in, in 10 times faster um, than they did it before. Um, and we reduced the, the failure rates um, dramatically. Um, all based on the work that my design team and me did, uh, making it simpler and easier to use. Um, when, I, when I came back to um, the scene here in Germany and especially the startup scene, I looked around and, and I was a bit skeptical because what I saw was a lot of businesses that only focused on being the next photo sharing uh, service, being like making the next crazy exit. And w what I didn't see was um, people that really wanted to make a difference, like people that saw that with the, the know-how, the knowledge, um, the experience we got, um, we could really make a difference, especially in times like these that are changing completely. I mean, all the paradigms that we know um, in terms of how we build businesses, how we, um, how we go to market, the market itself, like all the users, the demands of the users are changing. Every system, every paradigm we, we see is changing through the digital revolution. Um, and we, we can actually make a difference. We can build services that help people. And the only thing I see right now is that most of the people are focused on um, building the next X because it sells good, you can make a huge exit, but there are so many markets beside education. I mean, we don't have to go to Africa. I, I mean, I love working in, in healthcare because I really saw the meaning of my work. Um, but I mean, even the Western world, there's so many stuff that we could reinvent that we can, could make better with all the knowledge we got. Um, go into education, revolutionize the healthcare system in the Western world. Um, like you can really make a difference and I mean that's why I'm here I'm not here um, to talk about like how can you make your business growing faster I want to encourage all of you to um, think about is the, the business model you're working on right now is the idea you're working on right now is it really relevant like does it really help people or is it just wasting my time your talent your energy um, and I, I hope I can, uh, I can give some impulses um, to all of you um, to get the satisfaction that I got in, in the job that I did so far in the job that I do right now because uh, believe it or not, we, we, we are also helping a lot of people around the world with the product we build right now. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's it. Okay, thanks. Our, our next uh, speaker is S Simon Ho Hoher? Close enough? Okay. Uh, who wrote his thesis at Zeppelin University on the World Bank and the potential of dynamic learning networks as a new paradigm in, the, in international development cooperation. In 2009, he joined the Observatory of Cultural Policies in Africa, hosting various international events in close cooperation with UNESCO, African Union, and European partners. And as a freelancer, he's been working with cultural projects, foundations, and startups in Berlin before he co-founded Knowable.org in 2011. Simon? Uh, thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Simon. And um, <clears throat> actually, I want to start out with your question when you ask what do you see when you think of Africa. Um, I just returned tonight from Mozambique, where I spent the last two, three weeks. The, first thing that popped into my head was actually this huge, huge traffic jam I got stuck in for like three hours yesterday, <laughs> um, which was actually quite interesting because um, since I was stuck in this traffic jam, it was actually uh, in a place called Benfica, just outside Maputo, the capital of Mozambique. Um, so I was stuck in this car, so I was sitting in the car <laughs> waiting for people to go on and I was looking out there, outside the car and in that area, you would actually see tons of actually street shops right at the street where people sell pretty much everything they get. 
And um, I was pretty amazed when I took a closer look because normally you just rush by and you think, okay, that's just rubbish they found and sell. But if you take a really close look, you see like they sell crazy stuff. Like they literally take everything they find and build new stuff out of that. And uh, actually, this is pretty much what is like the what amazes me, and this is also pretty much the the basic idea of what we are doing with Noble Arc. So, um, just to give you a little idea, I don't know if you come across it. So, uh, I want to tell you some of these stories we I've met or encountered in the last month. Uh, one of them is actually happening in Guatemala. There's a guy called Carlos. And what he does is he takes old bicycles and transforms them into actual machines. Um, he calls them busy machinas and they become power generators or oil mills or whatever you have. Um, it's very, very useful for people actually who encounter everyday problems like in this case lack of power or electricity with easy to find everyday day-to-day -day materials and thereby can actually solve this problem. Like in this case, they make aloe vera oil, uh, oil and sell that. Um, he's actually building an organization called Maya Pedal. They've been quite successful, have a very strong impact on the ground. And it's all based on stuff that you find on a good and creative idea and just like building it and making it. Um, the next one, uh, the next story I came across was uh, happening mainly in Ghana. It's an organization called um, Bicycles for Humanity. And what they do is they not just ship and um, yeah, provide people with bicycles again, but uh, actually they teach people how to build it, how to use them, uh, how to repair them, how to tinker around them, and actually how to construct them by themselves. Um, there are like plenty of similar uh, initiatives around. So in the past months, I've seen bicycles made of bamboo, uh, made of tape made of paper even. So again, you find this, whatever you have at hand and just putting it together, kind of hacking it um, and just see how can you like actually solve your problems. In this case, it would be mobility, obviously, or lacking infrastructure or transportation. Um, and the th third one um, is actually one of my favorites. It's a good friend of us now who is from Paris. His name is Romain and he was designing with some people who study product design. Um, something called Jerry. Jerry is actually a fully functional DIY network server that you can build in a water can. So again, it takes like easy to find everyday materials, old rubbish, uh, not used uh, computer electronic parts, puts them all together and you have a uh, fully, uh, fully customizable open hardware computer that you can build by yourself. He built that in Paris. They were traveling to Burkina Faso, to Amsterdam. Then we invited them over here in Berlin. Uh, in the Beta House, you have the Open Design City, which is kind of a, a workshop, open workshop space. So we built that there. It's lots of fun. Uh, he was going on to, to Cote d'Ivoire after that. And again, you have this kind of making spirit that kind of drives us as well. So um, this is kind of the, the background of, of, of that, that inspired us to do what we're doing because if you take a look at these ideas you find there's thousands of stories I could tell like that all over the world you find thousands of just amazing ideas you find everywhere so the big big challenge I think we're facing today is actually make these challenge uh, these ideas accessible so how can we learn about them how can we like uh, tweak them how can we hack them how can we do them ourselves and thereby like solving critical uh, practical problems ourselves. So that's exactly where Knowable steps in. We are basically a social network for makers with a mission that is uh, yeah, a platform that provides people with access to these kinds of ideas. How could they use existing resources to uh, yeah, solve their everyday problems, be it in Berlin or in Bangladesh or in uh, Mozambique. So, I've been working on that for about a year right now. Um, we've been starting with the developing about early this year and just launched our prototype for that a couple of months ago. So um, at this stage, we're very looking forward into really getting the community in, into really connecting makers. So I think just to, to finish, um, or to get it to the broader picture of this panel, I think um, the huge potential we see today uh, is definitely, on the one hand, the, po the, the potential of technology, which is 
in this case, information technology, infrastructures, devices, mobile devices, and literacy in, in dealing with that on the one hand, and on the other hand, just the fun of men and women, of like humans just building stuff and just like tinkering around, getting good ideas and like working on them. And I think if you kind of merge that and put that together, there's a lot of potential in there because entrepreneurship basically is all about making stuff. It's just about what do you have at hand, how can you hack it, and how can you solve your problem. First part is not, doesn't matter if it's online or offline or technology based or whatever, it's just this kind of making spirit. And I think there's huge potential in that. Next question would be if that's social, if that's, uh, I don't know, not social, is that modern, but I think we can discuss that later on. <laughs> Thanks. Great. And our, our last uh, speaker is Felix Krauss. He's one of the founders and the CEO of Milk the Sun, which is the first B2B portal in the field of fo photovoltaics uh, for rooftop and greenfield owners, roof agents, project developers, installation companies, banks, insurers, and investors alike. The portal brings all market participants together and integrates service providers in the area of solar energy. Felix? Thank you very much. Um, I must admit, I think I'm the least social person here on the stage. So um, I hope not to disappoint any of you. Um, we found it milk the sun to make money, and only to make money. Um, the good effect on the other side is that we help reducing CO2 emissions, and that as a long-term goal, but not only by the company, but by providing support for the solar energy, or the, for the solar producers, um, we make electricity affordable in Africa because the whole energy problem can be solved in Africa, at least to certain parts, through solar systems, and we help to make them cheaper. Um, we provide a platform for people to invest in solar installations. Uh, one of the problems that you have is a normal investment that you have is over 20 years, and people don't invest in them because it's a long time you need to invest, we provide a platform to trade. Um, that enables um, more PV installations to be built because, because people have an easy access strategy, which eventually should lead to also reducing prices um, and then hopefully enabling um, more solar systems being built in Africa so that those people are helped. But our main goal is to make money, sorry. So uh, we, thank you for your candor. Um, we want to turn this, we want to make this a discussion and I'm sure you have questions, but let me, let me get it going. When, uh, I, I want to play off the, something that Simon said and that Felix said. Um, the, the, the line between um, a traditional startup and a social startup is very blurry. And uh, I found it interesting when I was talking to the speakers about what order uh, they would speak in, uh, you know, they all, as usual, they all wanted to speak last. And uh, Felix argued that he was the least social and therefore should speak last. And then, that, you know, he had competition. They were all sort of arguing, except Simon, I think, about who is the least social. And I, I kind of want to get at what is this, I mean, I, I have my own point of view on this, but that's, that's, that's uh, not relevant. I, what is the stigma? What is the association that you all find with the, with the concept of the social startup? What, what does it mean? Do you embrace it? It sounds like not too much. I mean, I, I for instance, Felix, I don't, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you're in this just to make money. Uh, I mean, I believe there are lots of other dimensions to what drive people, and if all you wanted to do was make money, you, I don't believe you, you would be in this field. But can you sort of each take a swing at that question and then we'll turn it open? No, of course not. We are not. It's not only to make money. It's also to 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 like help solving a problem. But I reckon that about being social about what we do it is if it doesn't pay out of in in the, in the end of the day and if it doesn't pay out our bills, uh, we would be quite stupid to do it. And um, I don't know about the rest of us, but we are definitely uh, depending on outside money. So we need to have people in our company that have a clear exit strategy and uh, we need to focus on their interests as well. Now, the good thing is that by focusing and expanding our business, we help doing good. So uh, 
maybe that's the thing. But I wouldn't name us as a social company because at least in certain areas, it got a, a strange tweak to it if we would claim to only be a social company. Okay. Um, I had a discussion some days ago with a friend of mine about exactly that point because she is in this social area, the social entrepreneurship area, and I'm, I just said, you know, that's, I mean, do you really care about this social in front of entrepreneurship? Because, I mean, when you look at the past, entrepreneurs had a social responsibility all the time. Um, it, it was it me. It just got lost, or um, we, I know we, we don't care about it anymore, but when you look at the past and what an entrepreneur is, um, then he has responsibility, social responsibility, for the people um, he works with, for the people he builds a product for or solves a product, uh, problem for. Um, Oftentimes, I think the social entrepreneurship is only broken down to this small piece of where you go to Africa and help uh, poor children suffering. I mean, of course, that's a problem, but I, I don't see the point why we should have like a social entrepreneurship category. That, and I think that's why the whole discussion simply um, is not worth the time. I, we should simply talk about what are the responsibilities of entrepreneurs and what do we expect Uh, from entrepreneurs, um, and what is the motivation of people building businesses? Is it only to make money? I, I also don't believe in it. I mean, there are some guys that pretend to only want to make money, but I, I totally agree. I think that's not the only, it can't be the only, I mean, if that would be the case, yeah, I, I would be really pessimistic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I very much agree with the, my, the, wonder, the wonder kid here. Uh, <clears throat> I also think that uh, like entrepreneurship is like uh, creating the new, creating something for consumers, like disrupting the market, uh, making the world, like making something just just better in, than what there already is. And I mean, that in itself must be like good. So I think also, and historically, ent like entrepreneur creates something good. What I find when I sometimes speak also to social is that like, social entrepreneurs is they they feel like the, it needs to have something to do with self-sacrifice. It, it, it's more like I, I, I am a social entrepreneur because I, uh, I don't make any money. And, uh, and I mean, my argument uh, against that, like, well, my argument here is that you, unless that you, you find a business model, you won't be a social entrepreneur that long because I mean, you can't, you know, how will you survive basically? Uh, and if you get aid for your project, then when the aid, stop, like aid uh, stops, then your project falls apart, which a lot of the project in Africa is, uh, is doing. Um, so uh, I agree. I, this one thing that I, a couple of examples, for instance, uh, 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 Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, I'm, I'm pretty sure when he, he started Facebook, that he, I mean, he, he actually started like a meat catalog, right, for, for, for Harvard students. And uh, that was maybe his motivation, but he ended up building a platform that maybe have caused a revolution. I mean, so even his intentions, uh, the, same with, uh, like the same with Twitter. I mean, even people going out building something, maybe and it ends up being used for something like greatly useful. So I think like Zuckerberg is definitely a, a, a social entrepreneur in, in, in the sense of impact, much more than a lot of other who just do it for for you know, saying that they, they don't make any money, basically. Yeah, um, it's actually, I absolutely agree. Um, As we were just talking about before, I think this line between is this social or not? Uh, <clears throat> actually, I can just say this has cost us a lot of time of explanation and actually of asking ourselves, are we social? How far are we social? Is it allowed to make money if you're social? Uh, in what terms is social <laughs> social? Um, I think uh, we were just talking about this example, uh, especially when it comes to Africa. I think there are lots of 
um, companies, uh, this whole sector of mobile payments is like boosting and growing everywhere. So oh, I was just this question bumping to my mind is like, is a regular, like plain, normal startup going to Africa implementing, uh, implementing a, a technology to uh, enable mobile payments? Is that a social company? It's like, let's say it's like 100% VC funded, it's 100% exit strategy uh, based. So is that a social company? I mean, again, you could argue, okay, this offers a solution for financial transactions for a target group that is mainly based in rural or poor areas, they would have not a way before to transfer money, but now they have a way. So they obviously now, there's a solution to a problem that was not there before. So I think you can like model that to pretty much every, every, every company. In our case, it's definitely we provide access to, to crucial or practi practical information that has, has, would not be there otherwise. Uh, but again, how far is that social? So I think it makes sense to some extent. It's very interesting to discuss that. But when it comes to the like, entrepreneurial part of that, uh, I think this um, kind of gets loses a little bit of, of importance uh, because then it gets to like, what do you manage to produce? What do you manage to kind of develop and to implement and to make happen? So, and if you make something happen, most certainly it will be so, uh, will be social. So. Uh, this is the one thing. The other thing, I think this whole discussion, as I said, has cost us a lot of time. And I think there's this kind of general perception. I mean, I'm from Germany and especially here in Germany, you find that a lot. It's, um, we've, been, we've been asking that, are you social or are you a normal company? So. Did it, did it change the th the, what you do? Um, actually, it did not, it, it, but it changed how we talk about what we did. So in the first place, we said, yes, of course, we're social. When, then we suddenly found ourselves like, yeah, but we don't want to be like a regular NGO. We, we want to pull this off at a, as a, like a regular startup. We want like seed funding. We want like this has to be an enterprise. So yeah, maybe we are not that social. So then for us, it was again, are we social? So actually we've been going through this process until we get to this point where we just thought, okay, we are just what we are. <laughs> call it modern, call it social, call it a startup or whatever. It's just like, it, I think it loses importance uh, as soon as you start building it because in the end, it's about developing a product. It's about uh, telling about what you do. And it's not about telling people and selling uh, like the, the idea of social. I think there's another good startup, uh, good good idea. This I don't know if you know, familiar with Kinderfee, the the German startup. They actually uh, provide uh, families with babysitters. Um, they were like, I, I just met one of the co-founders a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me actually they are solving a social problem: the lack of childcare that you find in Germany, which is very big. But they also encountered this big kind of prejudice like you make money you can't be social so I think they kind of got the idea of it doesn't make sense to get too much in this kind of definition part but rather make things happen and then that that's worth it <laughs> right um, I just want, want to add two things um, first it is not bad to earn money uh, because when you exactly because when you earn money when you have a clear monetization strategy it allows you to go on I mean, that's important. It allows you to do the stuff you do. It, it, it allows you to build even better solutions. Um, and second is, um, again, the social thing. I mean, there, we have a lot of problems to solve here. And why should I not solve uh, a problem in education, delivering better education solutions for um, children in Germany, for example, or in Europe, um, or in the US? Um, why should that be um, like not social or social so th that's that's what I mean I mean we, we have a lot of problems to solve simply let's let's start building it that that's it that's more or less exactly what I wanted to say is a very very, yeah. very summarize first come no, first serve very true um, no it's it, it, it's it's basically um, the important thing is when you leave or when you when you sell your company or when when you leave whatsoever this earth is like what impact have you left? And then I think the the most important point is it's not 
why we do something, but it's if we can help solving a problem. And I think we all agree on this stage that no matter what reasoning we have for doing certain things, we all want to want to solve a problem. We all want to solve certain problems that, that arise either socially or environmentally. And that makes it to a certain extent social, but I wouldn't claim, again, us as a social company. But we want, of course, to ha have an impact And I think that's a nicer or an easier definition than to be discussing over am I social or am I not. Let, let turn it over to you. Um, questions? Uh, are, are, you, are you the microphone? Okay. Hi, Dejan from uh, Erste Foundation in Vienna. Uh, well, there is a clear definition on what is social business and uh, I would just like to give maybe an example since we work a lot with social business. Uh, an example is, let's say, what uh, Mohammed Yunus, one Nobel Prize winner for peace, uh, is usually promoting. Social business is a business that uh, uh, where the shareholders or the owners of the company do not earn money from but reinvest into a future development of the business that you're doing. Uh, for example, uh, but also for example, uh, the business normal business, money-making business, can also be a social business. Adidas, for instance, in Bangladesh, developed a one-dollar shoe for the kids who do not have shoes. Okay, for them, this is a very nice marketing uh, idea, but on the other hand, it's a social business as well. So, it's not black and white. There is a very big gray area. So, there is a many, many examples of this. So I think all of you who are doing business and earning money can also do social business on the side. And it's... But that's exactly what I mean. Why should we waste time uh, by discussing that, that definition? Yes? No, no, yeah. Okay. Why should we waste time by discussing this definition? Uh, we should discuss like problems and solutions. And I mean, I work with the Gates Foundation, for example. It's a, it's a brilliant example, you know. Um, I mean, Bill Gates earned a ton of money and now he is solving like the biggest problems that mankind right now has, at least in the, in the healthcare area. Um, and I think he never thought about like, oh, am I building a social business? I'm a, I, am I a social entrepreneur? Okay. Others? Questions? Say where you're from, if you help. Um. I'm Chiara, I'm from Italy, and uh, um, I wanted to, to say that, as far as I know, um, a social enterprise is one that has, uh, that measures its, its success not only on the basis of the money that they get, I mean, the, sustain the economic sustainability, but also on the basis of targets that are on, on a, of, a social, um, of a social kind. For example, how like you try to measure the impact that you do uh, in your target market or whatever. So, what what do we say about this kind of definition? Just having uh, a measurement of your success on two sides instead of just one. Yeah, uh, I agree, but I think um, ideally, but probably always, this kind of two dimensions are more or less linked. So you won't be able to make money uh, in a sustainable um, and proper way for a long time if you kind of completely leave out uh, the actual impact and the actual uh, like um, value, added value that you, that you provide to your customers. So um, I think I absolutely agree. This actually has to be kind of uh, in, the, in the spot, but um, I think there's pretty much no way around then kind of linking these both sides. But I think uh, this, when it comes to like the social entrepreneurship, which seems like connecting two worlds, um, pretty much it's boiling down to entrepreneurship again, where you where you need to take impact on the ground on stake. Even in order to make more money, you have to see okay. Does my one dollar shoe can I actually sell it? How can I provide it to more people? How can I I don't know produce it even better? Um, this is something that is highly market driven but can actually generate a very strong social impact. So um, I agree. I know I'm familiar with the social business definition by Mohamed Yunus. 
And I, I know it's uh, sometimes can be quite narrow and some companies that do in fact provide social impact do not fall in this definition. So again, I think, yeah, it's a label and they, you can like change it, but it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Again, make stuff happen. <laughs> Was there someone back, back there who had a... <clears throat> Florian Gall from uh, the Center for Digital Technology and Management in Munich. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you gentlemen, what do you think besides the social, which we now heard is probably more a measure than a label, where you say, okay, we have impact in certain markets and on certain people's lives, which would be economic and social impact. Um, what would be another measure that you would like to see your company measured where you say we are an honest company because we don't cheat our users or we have honest terms of use agreements um, or any other thing? What, what would you, each of you maybe just have as a measure that your company would like to be measured with? Um, I think, uh, I, like I said in, in the introduction, I think that... No, no, no I, I believe that times are changing dramatically. And I think things that, like you said, like honesty, transparency, openness, they are like fundamental uh, factors of future businesses. Um, in, in this interconnected digital world, you simply can't fool people in the long term. You can still do it short term, it works, um, it was pretty well for, for some, some guys out there, um, but I think times are changing dramatically uh, and we are becoming um, a more social, honest, whatever, um, society, um, simply because we can talk about everything, you know? When somebody fools me uh, with his product or service or company or whatever, I mean, I can talk to all of you immediately. You know, when I, I get fooled, uh, I will share it on Twitter in the second I get fooled. And um, we, we see that in, in very different variations and dimensions. There was like the Arabic Spring and stuff like this. You know, I think honesty, transparency, that is kind of the fundament of future businesses. I think uh, there's a very, <clears throat> very interesting article about an, uh, written by an economist called Bumol. He talks about the uh, rent-seeking behavior. So he says like there's a there's a it's a certain amount of entrepreneurship in a, a society as a such, and what determines uh, if it turns out good or turns out bad is the rules we we have. So maybe in Africa, the brightest becomes uh, politicians because that's where you make the most money. You make a hundred thousand dollars a year. So. Uh, it's kind of like it, you go into rent seeking and rent seeking is where you use the power of the state to give yourself an advantage the best situation it's best is probably the banks i mean the banks has uh, it's the most regulated market it's very hard for entrepreneurs to enter in and make the banking better because of uh, regulation and banks use regulation to keep people out so one of the things that i think is really bad uh, as an entrepreneur do you think always um, hard to measure but you should ask yourself the question is, are you making, are you making money by using laws, by using uh, regulation to make the money to keep others out? Or are you actually making uh, a product that you know, competes with existing or, or you know, make uh, better products for consumers? I think that's a very, uh, I think that's kind of interesting. It's not something people talk about. They just say banks are evil and capitalism is even, evil. Instead of looking at what is actually, I mean, government is a big, big factor in, in this. Uh, so I think that's, uh, I don't know, I, that you can't measure it, but um, it, I think it's interesting to, to maybe discuss what I think about. Hey, oh, Felix. I, I really like your question. It's just um, to be measured on something, um, it is pretty hard, or what impact we want to have. Um, but but as, as the other two said, like transparency is definitely the thing. Like we want to use the advantages of uh, the web that we have and bring it into intransparent markets that work probably like banks or anything else that where, where the internet is not that yet used 
and, and have an impact there, make it transparent and, and use the advantages the internet has to offer. So I'd, I'd like to offer an observation, which is that uh, there's, a, there's a, an individual I know who is a uh, very, so, I mean, by any definition of social, this guy is social and, and his motivation and his business practices. At this point, his company is making the bulk of its revenues, which are considerable, f from Rio Tinto, which is not generally thought of as a social extractor. Um, and the reason Rio Tinto has hired um, this guy and his firm is they have bought the rights to the largest copper deposit in the world in Mongolia. And what is the biggest threat to Rio Tinto and its copper rights in Mongolia? It's, 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 ex it's a state expropriation. It's a Venezuela situation. It's something like that that would you know, turn all its millions and billions of dollars you know, to shit instantly. Um, and Rio Tinto looked around for someone who had a really clear idea of how it's possible to develop an extractive industry, which almost by definition, I mean, the, the word itself, extractive, is, you know, says it all. They looked for someone who could give them a, a clue about how to move forward in a way that would um, lessen the threat of expropriation, lessen, lessen the threat of losing their investment. And so for them, social was a competitive need. And for, you know, for my, my friend, it was a competitive advantage in getting the business. And what I hear from, you know, coming up again is, you know, particularly from Felix, if I can pick on you, is that, you know, it, it's, it, it's almost a feeling that if we look too social, people will think we're not serious and they won't invest and give us the, the means of sustainability. You know, 15 years ago, someone who was a, addressing a, a real need of climate change, you know, I mean, this, we wouldn't have this discussion. It would be obviously a social project, but you obviously so, see some need to distance yourself from looking too much like a do-gooder for, for business purposes. What? To a certain extent, yes. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to offer that, that sometimes social is something of a competitive advantage in the marketplace because the marketplace is shifting. Um, and let me turn it back to you. Questions come? Hi, my name's Vanessa. Um, that leads quite nicely into my question, actually, what you just said. And um, we, or you guys spoke a lot about um, the entrepreneur side of it, and you just said that um, if you're too social, it might make you, you know, less attractive to investments, and therefore you go away from the social side in order to uh, get investments and to build your business and make things happen, which is really what we want to do. Um, so my question is, um, the development in the States now with, say, the Acumen Fund, which has been around for many years already, and it's established this view of patient capital um, that, that just aims to um, do just social investments with a long-term view. And I was wondering what, you, what your views on the development um, on the social investment side will be or if it has a future for um, really making a difference and, and therefore maybe in the future if there is social capital available we might not have to go away from that social business which it does have a very clear definition like um, the server there said and, and is very important to making an impact if you, if you want to take it from, from that side. Panelists, anyone want to swing at that? I, we haven't spoken to that company, or, but we had been speaking to uh, certain VCs that focus on their sustainability or the environmental impact. Um, the critic I would have to say to those companies is that uh, all of them weren't in angel or seed fi financing. They all wanted to see like a proven track record of two or five million turnover. So those companies that we had a look at um, at least all turned us down because we couldn't provide that track record yet. Yeah, I think that, that proves what, what I just assumed, um, that in general they don't work much differently than like the normal funds. 
Um, maybe their their the long term perspective is a bit longer, uh, but like what we need as entrepreneurs, especially when we go into the social areas, is risk taking, um, and that's that's a part that the entrepreneur brings. But um, if, when it comes to really new ideas and and disruptive ideas. Um, we need also risk taking um, money in the end um, and I, I really doubt that um, those those kind of funds really work differently on, on that part because otherwise it makes simply no sense to have them or to, to name them differently so um, just another observation about acumen and, and, and in general you know on, on one level I, you know, I saw some eye rolling from the panelists at one point, which I interpreted as, you know, why are we talking, why are we do, engaging in this semantic wanking, you know, when we could have, you know, we should be talking about projects. But I, I, would, I would argue that words matter, concepts matter, and I would also argue that there's a, we should think of not social versus, you know, antisocial, uh, but a really blended and rapidly changing world. So the Acumen Fund, was started with a seed investment from the Rockefeller Foundation where Jack, Jacqueline Nov Novogratz, who founded it, worked but was a program officer. Without that seed investment, perhaps there'd be no Acumen Fund and now they can you know, pioneer patient capital. They've, they've drawn support from both areas. You know, it, I would encourage people to think of two things. First of all, a blended marketplace. And secondly, we're all about satisfaction. We're all about meaning. And we have, op we have I, I think it's a, you know, when, when I was starting in my career and thinking of myself as a meaning-oriented person, the private sector was not an option. I envy you guys, you know, I, I envy you for being in a world where you can really, you know, have a much greater choice of where to find that satisfaction and apply your talents. I imagine we're running out of, running out of time, but maybe we have time for one or more comments. Uh, anyone else? Back there. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm Fadi. I live in Czech Republic. And I have a question for you. Uh, from my uh, everyday practice, uh, like I was really a l very meaningful, a very meaning-oriented person. And I really tried to start my companies to make a difference. But I have my experience, uh, especially in contact with corporation, that there is a lot of cynicism, um, um, uh, especially on the sales positions and people who are really running a lot of money, that they are actually like on conferences and uh, in PR, they are claiming that they are focusing on values and really changing things. But uh, when you talk with them, you can feel that they are not really interested in changing things and they even behave really in unethical ways just to reach uh, their profits. And uh, it's kind of culture um, uh, which is connected especially to finance businesses like banking and um, but even in pharmaceutical companies I met a lot of people like that. And it was really hard for me to keep my motivation and not to be influenced by this cynical attitude and to really try to improve the ethics. So I want to ask if you have any tips how to deal with these situations or if you have any uh, similar experiences. Thank you. Great question. Um, there, there is a, a one clear reason why I am not working anymore in healthcare, like especially in the uh, market that I worked before. It was connected to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and yes, um, the, the, it's not not at all ethical or, or social or whatever. Um, but I met a lot of great entrepreneurs. Um, there is a huge initiative in, in the Valley, for example. There are great products in Africa, in, in Asia, like young entrepreneurs. Um, they are starting to change, but how, I mean, you can't change everything within five years or 10 years, which is there for 100 years or more. Like, and of course, there are greedy people out there, and of course, they, they want to secure what, what they got. But, and, I, and that's what, what I mean, that's what I tell all, all the, the young entrepreneurs that I'm talking to, that I try to mentor, is I mean, today, m more than ever, we have the chance to really start over. And there are people with money they want, that want to fund like disruptive ideas and disruptive concepts. And 
I mean, I was really frustrated frustrated when I when I decided to to move on and and don't work in that industry again. But um, in the future, I, I can really imagine to work again in healthcare because it's such a, a meaningful, such a great market, and there's so much to innovate. I mean, in the Western world, um, as much as in in, in uh, less developed countries. Um, so I, I simply can say I understand frustration, but I see a lot of more than hope. I, I really see um, a positive change, and I, I really uh, want to encourage you to to move on. I mean. Go and if you really believe that this makes a difference, do it. Definitely. Yeah, don't speak to the big corporations. I think like um, I've worked for two larger corporations. Um, they are slow. And uh, if you have a good idea and if you really believe in, in the idea, just like Ben said, um, look for people that, that, that also share your beliefs and, and like have the same drive and then focus on them and not on the big corporations. Because if the big corporations believe in you, they probably just copy you and leave you out, or they won't react at all. So if you really believe in it, do it yourself. If they believe in you, you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Rio Tinto. <laughs> I think he's doing it, okay. Okay, well, I, I think uh, we're, we're out of time. I'd like to, I'd like to close with um, one plug. If you, if you don't want to discuss social, but do social, at 7 o'clock at door 803, uh, we're going to try to hack transparency. We're, we're Transparency International and Random Hacks of Kindness uh, are developing hacks that will open up, govern, open up government data and it's a global problem. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Random Hacks of Kindness, but it's an incredible organization that organizes hackathons around social issues. And we're just going to try to take advantage of you being here this week to uh, proceed along a path that's already started in, in uh, analyzing data and creating hacks. So it's, it's an experiment. Uh, door 803, 7 o'clock. See you there. Thank you all and thank our panelists.